All right, well, uh, welcome to this, a very special episode of the After Movie Diner, um, because this week, a little bit of uh, a change, we're going to be doing a commentary for Local Legends. Now, if you've listened to the last few episodes of The Diner, I've been mentioning this film a lot. Uh, it's a fantastic film. Uh, it was made in Massachusetts by Mr. Matt Farley, who uh, joins me here today. Say hello, Matt. Hello, sir. And you are the writer, director, and star of this film, yes? That's correct. And uh, we're about to sit down and do a commentary now. There has been a DVD pressed, I understand, but there's no official commentary on it. There's nothing on it, just the movie, yeah. Okay, so what this is going to do, uh, this is going to be a supplement to both the DVD, if you're lucky enough to have it, or if uh, you're watching this on YouTube, uh, you're going to be able to put this on, sync it up, and uh, when we start watching the film, you can start watching the film, and hopefully our commentary will go along with it. Uh, so will the DVD be available? Do you have a website uh, that you're going to put it up on? Or uh, No, uh, I've I just I'm just kind of been spreading it out. I just sent out a whole bunch for review, and I send them to record stores. Uh, if someone wanted a DVD, they could contact me, 603-644-0048. But you can just watch it for free on YouTube, too. Yeah. So uh, this will also be available on YouTube. So, yes, you'll be able to watch it. And what's you're over at Moton Media? Yeah. Okay. So that's Moton, M-O-T-E-R-N, Media. And if you look that up on YouTube, you'll find it. It's the top video there, and uh, it's called Local Legends. And did you want to preface the movie before we go into it with any... Uh, do you want to plug anything? Do you want to say anything? Do you want to start anything? Or No, let's just hit play and, uh, and start talking, I think. Great. Excellent. All right, sir. Uh, well, when you're ready, count us in. Okay. Three, two, one, play. Okay, so first up in the movie is this uh, comedy club scene. Uh, where is this and, and where was this filmed? This was in Manchester, New Hampshire, a place called Murphy's. Every Wednesday night, uh, you can hear the guy introducing me. His name is Nick David. He does a open mic comedy show. And uh, he was kind enough to let me, um, let me film. I had three people uh, in the audience um, <coughs> uh, doing their thing. And is this an actual is this an actual set or is this specially invited audience type deal? Oh no, this was just an actual night at the um, the thing. Uh, I just doing what I would normally do. I when I lived in Manchester, I used to perform there all the time. So um, so I just you know I was trying to recreate it as as uh, true to what it would be like as 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 possible, and you know hence the lack of laughter. <laughs> I see. I, I was wondering whether you had, because obviously I was there later on with some of the film, whether you had told them to react a certain way or whether this was a real, a real thing. I think if it's a real thing, they need to get a sense of humor and enjoy themselves more. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, I know, because um, yeah, a lot of people have commented. A lot of people who watch it have said, "Wow, tough crowd." But um, uh, I thought the jokes were a lot funnier than the the reception they got. But that that's what happens at these open mic nights. Most of the people there are comedians just waiting to get on stage. They don't really care about what you're doing, right? And you, and you don't really care about what they're doing. So this is this is what it's like for a local legend. Yeah, indeed, and that's why I thought you'd done it this way is to set it up because it does really sort of show the anxiety of the guy on stage, even though the the jokes are good you know that the the material is good and and it's it's odd because i have to say that the the stand-up that you do and uh matt d does who's later in the film it was kind of sort of slightly different than the stuff you're used to or the stuff that you get seen on comedy central or or hbo or whatever is is that a style that you know you discovered or you you set up or is that a style that just is indicative of that area or um no it's not matt d is is one of the only other guys uh, there's a few others who who just just tell jokes you know right. uh it seems comedy is is very much into the personal uh storytelling and therapy up on stage but i'm very much opposed to that i just i just like to tell jokes yeah well, and i think that's maybe do you find that catches those audiences off guard then or yeah, and I mean, my jokes are wholesome, corny puns, you know, uh, that I tell with a, a, a sort of straight face, straight face. So I find the more, when people know what to expect from me, they, they react better. But 
I hadn't been up on stage in a while, and, and most of these people didn't know me. So, um, but that's fine. No, I think I think the set's really good. I mean, obviously, it works to set up the film as well. So, I mean, the crowd reaction is is kind of perfect for the movie. But uh, it, as I say, really in a real audience, I'm sure when they're watching the movie, will will laugh a lot harder. Um, I I love it too. I suppose there's like Zach Galifianakis kind of does it in his set, the sort of non sequiturs. Sometimes a pun, sometimes a little joke. He doesn't really do long diatribes or any of that. He does like little one-liners and stuff. So I suppose there's a he's the, he's the only guy I can think of. Right, and of course, you know Stephen Wright, of course. Stephen the, Wright, the yeah, classic, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not uh, devoted to the art of stand-up comedy. It's just a fun thing to do, and um, I've, I've. Oh, it took me like it's taken me like five years to get about ten minutes worth of material, and I'm satisfied with that. Excellent. And so this is one of your toilet bowl cleaner songs. Uh, do you want to give us a bit of a background on that? Yeah. Well, I um, I did a bunch of songs about celebrities because, uh, as the movie will explain later, I learned that people like to search the names of their favorite favorite celebrities on music sites, and so I was doing songs about celebrities and making a little bit of money. I was also making a little bit of money singing songs about poop because people search for poop, and then one day I thought, ooh, I can combine these two to create a powerhouse uh, album, Celebrities Fart and Poop Just Like Me and You, and so this is Scarlett Johansson Farts. Yeah, which is fantastic. Catchy as all heck, and uh, yeah, nice little... Nice little riff, nice little hook to it. Very good. Yeah, for just uh, for the filming of this, uh, so I had three three cameras all, um, and I had my wife in one spot. I had John Noble, the guy who plays the creepy um, weirdo in the car uh, later on in the movie. He, right. He was at another angle, and a friend of mine named Amelia was standing kind of sort of behind the stage. And uh, it was it's a little nerve wracking when you you got to go up there and perform and the whole time you're thinking, are they getting it and is the audio working? But uh, it, it came out surprisingly well. Oh, yeah, it's a fantastic opener to the movie. It's a it's a really strong professional looking piece when you when it first starts and the uh, obviously the titles interspersed. It's it's a classic way to do it, but it's a welcome way to do it. You know, it, it does work in terms of. This is a real movie, in we go, kind of thing. It, it, it's really nice. Now, now you told us this story on an interview that appeared uh, earlier on an After Movie Diner episode. Um, but just recap here. This is based on real life, right? This woman who claimed she had all of the Billy Joel records. Yeah, it was in, in college. And um, Tom and I were hanging out with uh, a girl he knew and a friend of hers. And uh, the friend of hers... And I started talking to Billy Joel. She claimed to have the whole collection. She invited me a couple floors up in the dorm to look at it. And um, I was outraged that she just had greatest hits one, two, and three. Yeah, which I think most people nowadays do, sadly. I think that's kind of most people's gateway drug to Billy, um, which is a shame. But it's a, it's a hilarious scene. And, of course, we're, we're missing the fact that it's Sharon Scalzo, who's back. Uh, this is your, well, fourth of fourth released film with her but you've been doing did she go back to like Druid gladiator clone and stuff like that as well no she started with freaky farley she started with freaky farley okay excellent and uh yeah she's great in the role of course there's that whole uh duality thing that happens later when you start talking about your real films that she's in <laughs> but... yeah yeah in, in a perfect world sharon could have played herself and likewise elizabeth could have played herself and i would have gotten actresses to play these characters but um i don't know i don't know any other female actresses so gotta i had to work around it yeah well they're both they're both great in the role and uh, obviously sharon is tom's sister yes okay and tom is in this scene and uh, he's your partner in mose haven which obviously the movie i feel it, it's has that aspect of on on one hand you'd really just like to be able to do you know the fun but also artistic stuff of Mo's Haven mm -hmm. um, and it's that conflict between you know look here's some really good stuff here's not only just some really good stuff but a whole back catalogue of amazing stuff of album after album after album but you know the one song that's doing really well is My Goldfish is Dead which is still a great song but it, that's the whole conflict of the, the film was that always going to be the case or were you going to write a much more you know, uh, not cut, n not be yourself, not have 
your own characters kind of thing. I'm trying to phrase a question and yeah, no, I know, I know exactly what you're saying. Um, let's see, I was, I mean, the first scene I thought of was the Billy Joel scene. Just you know, ever ever since it happened, I kind of noted to myself, this is good. I got to save this for a movie. Yeah. Um, and then things started to fall into place after that. Um, but it was pretty. No, I'd say Mose Haven was going to be a plot point early on. You know, in Rushmore, how um, the character has all those plays that he's put on. And whatnot, we see little snippets of it. Yeah, I, 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 I kind of like it when, when there's art in the movie that actually exists outside of the movie. Do you know what I mean? Oh yeah, completely. Yeah. So like, if there really were, and I know that the the Rushmore stuff is loosely based on stuff that Wes Anderson did as a kid, but everything that I reference in this movie actually exists. So. If I were watching it, I would be delighted to realize that, you know, this is a real song on a real album and this band has actually been toiling in, in obscurity for 15 years. Yeah, which is, you know, a crime. I mean, I know you obviously get a lot of uh, a lot of attention due to, like, the poo songs and the celebrity songs and food songs and animal songs, which are all great, too. I mean, nothing to take away from the uh, them. But, uh, yeah, I mean, Mose Haven, I will put on... You know, I hate to use this word, but I, you know, legitimately, I will put that on in my headphones, not to have a laugh or not to smile, but just to to enjoy the music and the lyrics and the, the things that you're you're coming up with. Um, I, one of the things that um, struck me about the film, and it's just, of course, jumped right out of my head. <laughs> um, anyway, let's talk about this, and then it might come back to me. So, you leaving CDs and films and everything everywhere. There's some stories attached to that. I've heard bands online and stuff talk about meeting you in the middle of nowhere and you're giving them a CD. Are there some are there some stories that didn't make it into the film about that? Um, the the best thing for me was I, I left a, a freaky Farley and at um, on the sidewalk near Brown University in Providence College, uh, Providence, Rhode Island. And a couple months later, I was invited to a screening of it at a fraternity house with a bunch of uh, people who had found it and called me and, and, and held a little a little viewing party. That was quite a unique experience for sure. Very cool. Did they like all try and get you drunk afterwards and all that kind of stuff? Or um, no, no. I mean, they were they thought it was cool and they also thought it was weird at the same time, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and it is, you know, and I, I did too, you know, I'm telling everybody, you know, if you don't hear from me, um, the search begins at this address. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Um, so this is soup. Now, uh, has soup been in other stuff or is this the first time he's appeared? So his real name is Chris Peterson. Um, been friends with him since high school. We made movies together, um, through high school and college. And then he moved out to LA. He's in river beast. He plays the, um, lecherous professor who's, uh, following Sharon back to town. Right, the pipe smoker, yes. Yeah, and um, we don't actually call him Soup. He's actually based on my roommate from college, who we called Soup, and I, we, he and I continue to meet up for basketball um, whenever possible, although we live hundreds of miles away. Um, I just, uh, part of the movie was just kind of whenever, I don't know, I just, I see movies that, that show the way people my age act. And I always just think to myself, that's not how I act. I, I'm disappointed in movies for not, um, create, you know, recreating a world that, that seems right to me. So I'm just going to do it myself. And, you know, these are real conversations that he and I would have during our basketball. So you would play the, the different NBA stars and all that sort of stuff. It's it's even more complicated. In fact, the script originally had like a good two minute long explanation of all the rules and <laughs> and, and laws and bylaws in our basketball series. That, but I had to I had to cut so much out just because I realized nobody no, nobody could possibly be as interested in this as I am. Well, I mean, it, I think what comes across is the the honesty of it. Like when you're talking about, you know, you don't see people represented in movies you know, that are like you. That's entirely true. I don't see people necessarily in movies represented uh, like me, but I think that you, you have an ability to put both on screen and into the voices of your characters a sort of honesty that although I don't, um, you know, I don't engage in any, like any of this stuff apart from making the music, I guess, but I, I, I don't really live this kind of life uh, personally, 
you know, I live in a different city and I, you know, I have have different types of conversations and things. Mm -hmm. I completely understand where everything is coming from and I understand what's put in there for comedic reasons, but also what's put in there for honest reasons. And I felt like the the sort of you and soup relationship that's in the movie is kind of it's kind of just like a really charming um you know representation of male friendship that doesn't sometimes comes across like wes anderson is a good example like he does put in interesting male friendships that don't really get explored elsewhere um and i felt like there was that element in the movie which was really nice yeah well i, I think the trick is uh if you're just honest about it like like you said, it doesn't have to actually reflect your experience as long. If if it's a movie that that's from the heart, and you know, you could watch watch a movie about about cooking, and you might not be interested in cooking, but if it's made by a person who loves cooking and is passionate about it, then then you get on board, kind of. Yeah, completely, and I think that that's what comes across, you know. And I have pals. I'm I'm a baseball fan, and I have pals who are really big into baseball and they do their you know their fantasy leagues and stuff like that and of course they'll talk about stuff that goes way over my head for ages but they'll talk about it with with passion and it's just exciting to be around those kind of people and i think that that's what yeah. comes across so obviously uh these scenes here with with sharon obviously it, it, it goes from the germ of the idea that that comes from a real life experience are any of these other things real life experience or are they observations of just a general type of woman or relationship um, she's based on like the worst qualities of several girls that I've met or seen over the course of a uh, decade. You know, th no one could, could be exact, be like this, I, I would hope. But, um, <laughs> I, I met a girl very briefly who, who was studying costume design and I said, Oh, cool. But that'll be up on Broadway. And she was outraged. She's like, how, why would I ever want my costumes on a stage? And I mean, I just, it never, it never occurred to me that people make costumes just to hang them up on, on the wall. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's definitely the type of person who would make a costume just to put it on a wall is different from a more practical, creative person, I think. Yeah, definitely. And it's a good, it's a good sort of weird parallel, I guess, to what the film is about in, in the sense of, you know, there's there's the person who would make costumes because they want to get those costumes used and hopefully paid for and hopefully become a costume lady on a show or a movie or on a, on a whatever, therefore kind of turning it into an occupation. And then there's the person who's like, no, my costumes are just to be stuck on the wall. It's not quite a parallel because obviously you want Mose Haven to also make money and, and, and be, 13, be uh, popular as well but you know there is that kind of parallel I guess kind of underlying metaphor to it in some weird way yeah unless I'm looking way too deep <laughs> no no such thing so now for the, this is another thing I'm proud of like I said with the Rushmore how um, it would be cool if the movies that they show within the movie were real the, you know I'm showing clips from this movie I made in 1997 here in the backyard of my parents house and uh it's just really cool to know you know to to make use of this that's been sitting in the basement for so long and uh, again if i watched a movie that showed clips that the filmmaker made 15 20 years ago i would be delighted the the hit with the frying pan is one of my favorite moments in the whole film it just it gets me every time i love it <laughs> yeah and I, I hope it just conveys to the audience someone who doesn't know me just conveys quickly the fact that like man this guy this guy and his friends put a lot of work into <laughs> movies that almost nobody sees, but or that they just understand the uh, enthusiasm and passion that goes into it. Yeah, no, definitely. And, you know, I dabbled in, in making movies myself at a certain point, just little things at university and things. And I completely understand of doing it for the joy of doing it and not necessarily caring who watches it or whatever, you know. And it's very it's, it's the same sort of thing. The reason why we do the podcast and we do the albums and things like that is just you do what you know. Uh, if money comes, great. If it doesn't, who cares? As long as uh, as long as people are having fun, really. Right, but you all, you know, you want to be heard. Uh, unlike the girl who would make a costume and put it on a, on a on a wall, you actually you want to communicate with people. I, I think this movie is could most I think most podcasters would watch this movie and just kind of be like yeah I get it because most podcasters are like you and just churning out this product for no you know with no reward and just doing it you know uh, because you're, you're crazy <laughs> yeah yeah but it's and it's fun but it's fun and I've met people and it's great and that's that is the spirit that this yeah, movie's made in the the thing that I was going to say earlier that I remembered again there was I don't know if you're big Monty Python fan at all but there was talk about when the meaning of life was being made 
that one of the ideas they were going to do was World War Three, and they were going to get the uh, soldiers to all wear uh, marketing and advertising and things like that all over their uniforms to pay for the movie. And it was going to be like that in-joke of, uh, you know, the advertising that you're going to see on screen, like with a sports uh, car racing or whatever yeah. like that. And, and there's that kind of and they never did it of course they thought it was too outlandish an idea but there's there's sort of that idea in this in some ways in a more creative way because uh, you're not just advertising pizza hut or whatever you're advertising stuff that you've gone out and created and things like that when did that idea come to you the idea of putting in the uh adverts and the promos and things like that within the movie um yeah, I think it just, you know, as it's expressed in the movie is how it is in my head, where um, as I'm writing the movie, I'm thinking to myself, this is a good, opp- <laughs> man, this movie is a good opportunity to tell people about uh, my music, but I sort of feel guilty about that because I want to just create a work of art. And But however, here I am toiling in obscurity and you only live once, I should take this advantage to, to <laughs> tell people about it. So, it, you know the inner struggle as you see it on the screen is very much how it was in my head my favorite se- some of my favorite sections of the film are you playing the agent which we'll come up to later uh, mm-hmm. obviously i'm talking all over mr mcgee the wonderful mr mcgee the, the legendary uh he's him and him and our household the moment we saw freaky farley and then uh manch vegas he immediately became uh, you know, another George Stover to us or another <laughs> Bruce Campbell or, you know, name your B-movie icon of choice, um, Jeffrey Combs or whoever. He's he's completely within that league. And and in this movie, he is phenomenally good. Uh, the, the, the line he says about soup where he says, soup doesn't cure anything is amazing. <laughs> it's just the best delivery of a line ever. Yeah, yeah, he was, he was great. And, um, you know, there's... For most of these scenes, it's it's just me and the actor, and no no one's even behind the camera. So this is just me and McGee in this little park that I I picked a spot that I knew was on his way home from work to make it as easy as possible. I got there half hour early, set things up. He got out of work, showed up. We worked for about an hour and a half and, and had the scenes done. And it, it was fun because um, you know the style of acting in this movie is is supposed to be. You know, we're going to be natural and, and real and actually funny as opposed to the style of the other movies. Right. And the American flag is a nice touch. <laughs> it sort of roots the whole film in this gleeful Americana that you, throughout all four of your movies, I think, have... Uh, there's that sense of it, there's that style of it, without it being chest thumping or annoying you know yeah yeah i did i definitely saw the flag and thought oh this will be good especially i think it's in the shot with mcgee on the phone you see the flag behind him because he's he's the i tell him all the time he's the greatest american yeah no he is definitely (laughs) (laughs) you know if you if you wanted anyone on a stamp it's it's mcgee that's you know what i mean in fact you know they always do stamps of you like elvis and marilyn monroe and you know war heroes and things like that I, to me, I want a stamp with Stover on it and a stamp with McGee on it. And, a, you know, these these real legends who have been toiling away for years and years. And years. That, would be, that would be amazing. Yeah, and then you could turn McGee over and lick him. That would he, <laughs> he would think it was right, too. He would not flinch for a second. Like, yeah, that sounds about right. I think <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be a lifelong ambition. Or, well, at least the last three years of my life ambition when I finally meet McGee. <laughs> that's gonna be uh, that's gonna be tremendous. I hope one day it happens. Mm-hmm. So you've got you're putting up here the twenty thousand songs bit. How many songs now are you up to, and is that still your goal, or are you gonna surpass it? Oh, I'm I'm sure I'll surpass it. I'm at thirteen thousand right now. Um, it's just the you know the biggest fear is that I'll run out of topics or songs, but I still have a long list of things I haven't haven't gotten to yet. So I'm just still still at it. Yeah, I, I had a couple of ideas recently. So, because uh, you were saying you wanted a, uh, you wanted a, what's the word? Like a, not an adversary, but you know what I mean? Like a rival. A rival, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, not that I'm ever going to go as far as uh, 13,000 songs just because I don't know that I have it in me. But uh. Yeah, well, that's why, like, a part of me is saying, should I tell people about this way I've discovered to make money through music? But then I realized nobody would do what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> and it doesn't even pay that well. If you, if you break down the hours I've put into it and the money I've made, I don't even know if it's minimum wage. Right. No, I wasn't going to, uh, you know, embark on a, <laughs> a real oh, you're driver. Welcome, welcome to. You're welcome to. But I, I, something tells me most people would lose. You, you might. You seem to have the uh, the enthusiasm and energy to actually do it. But most people would would give up after about a month or two. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, certainly the name name songs. I, I don't even know how how you approach that. But the the Millhouse uh, character. He's he does that wonderful YouTube show. Talk about Millhouse for a moment. Yeah, Millhouse G. I met him in the Manchester comedy scene, and there is a Manchester comedy scene in New Hampshire. It's it's pretty cool. It started around 2006, more or less, in a coffee shop, and it's it's gotten to the point where there's multiple comedy shows throughout the week, and and lots of guys who try it out. It's really it's really cool, and um and definitely the same way I was saying with with independent musicians and filmmakers and podcasters, there's the um the go get it at spirit of of in of a small time comic like in millhouse is portraying that the type of guy who would uh who would put so much effort into putting on a show like this yeah i mean his cooking with comedy stuff that i was watching the other day is 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 mind-boggling and it's you know they've got blue screen and they've got costumes and sets and various things but <laughs> all seemingly just to just to put it out there and do it, I guess. Yeah, isn't it great? I mean, it's people doing it just to do it, and that's that's beautiful. Yeah. Oh, no, completely. And I think that I know you said you had to wait a while to make the movie until you felt like it wasn't too, uh, you know, self-involved or whatever. You know, you wanted to at least have a body of work before you went ahead and made a film that was sort of Stardust Memories-like. Um, but actually, it's also good that you waited to the point where the internet is basically what you're describing, although you're describing it in a real sense with physical things. And, you know, the internet is basically also what you're talking about in terms of just people putting stuff out there as much as they can. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. I didn't, I didn't necessarily think of that. But, yeah, I mean, there's... I, those are the people who, if anyone's going to connect to this movie, it's going to be those people who are just toiling away on labors of love. The movie could have been called Labors of Love, too. Yeah, that... That would, I don't know, it also, that could sound like a weird, like, romantic movie, too. <laughs> right, that could sound like a, a, you know, a slightly softcore racy movie <laughs> that would be playing late night on some channel. Uh, so, the, yeah, these are some of my favorite scenes, but I have to ask, Coffee Milk, I, this is the first time hearing of it. Like most of your things, this is the first time hearing of it, and I'm already intrigued. What is it? It's a real thing. It's the official state drink of Rhode Island, and... Um, <laughs> It's just like chocolate milk, except it's just coffee-flavored syrup that you pour into your milk, and it's so good. I I, I have to limit myself because <laughs> I, w I would drink a gallon a day if I didn't have a little bit of self-control. Right, but not for the lactose intolerant, clearly, in our society. No, no, it's it's. It, but I I felt again um, <laughs> to do my small part in making the world aware of of coffee milk. I made it a, a prime. Um, plot point of the movie just you know just like i'm trying to get the word out there about my music in the manchester comedy scene i just want the world to know coffee milk is great and these little uh interstitials or whatever these little adverts for the the different albums and things this this was a delight for me because of course i i was one of the people who loved that um animal the guy who sings about animals promo that you put up on youtube uh, which anyone watching this once you've watched the movie go check out the singing uh, animal lover. The singing animal lover, uh, yeah. Uh, that promo you did, I've watched time and time again. I find it utterly <laughs> charming and wonderful. Um, yeah, thank you. That's how Charlie actually filmed that one with, with me. That was how we learned how to work the camera that we bought before filming River Beast. Yeah, so to have all these little ones in this movie was just fantastic. I never get tired of that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I feel uh, it, and again, like you said, waiting until you have a body of work or if you have something to say, I, I kind of looked at it as to say, I think I have enough material if you combine the jokes I know, 
the stories that have happened to me, the songs I've made, the movies I've made, I can somehow throw those all into one hour and 14 minute movie and it'll be pretty entertaining and maybe have a few things to say. Uh, and I, I noticed, just to give a bit of behind the scenes thing, I noticed again the, uh, the Moten Media clip on Mike. Uh, doing wonderful things to Soup's T-shirt in the scene. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I have no. I don't care one bit. As as he's clipping it on, he's like, "Doesn't this look terrible?" I said, yeah, "Don't worry about it." Yeah. Because uh, if you're gonna make a movie like this with people who who have lives and can only um, can only give you a couple of hours here or there to film all their scenes, you can't worry about details like that. Who cares if his shirt looks ridiculous? Yeah, no, of course. I, I was bringing it up because I remember when we were doing the bit in the, the laundry room later on, you were exactly the same, and I brought it up to sort of um, talk about that rather than necessarily to point it out as a negative. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. I didn't take it. I, I can't be insulted anyway. But um... <laughs> As this scene will show, because here's a scene where this guy appears to be a fan, uh, but it turns out to be, well, <laughs> a bit of a it's, critic. That's pretty much a true story, word for word. Uh, I, 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 some guy showed up and, and said pretty much everything in the scene. The I, gall uh, of people like that. I, I mean, I don't, you know, say nothing. You know what I mean? I don't understand someone's need to tell you that they could do better. I was delighted by it. I thought it was fantastic. <laughs> But um, it does happen. Uh, but just, I mean, my personal, uh, I, I'm not going to put a year of, of hard work and effort into someone else's idea for a movie, you know. So uh, if I'm making a movie, I'm just going to make my own. But people do sometimes try to um, tell, you know, imply that they have better ideas than mine, to which I say, awesome, go Go make one. Yes, be gone. <laughs> be gone from my sight. And go this guy, somewhere. this guy is Ryan. Uh, Ryan Damaris. He works with me at my uh, at my job at a group home, and uh, he played Cupcake Eater Number Two in River Beast, and now he's moved on to having more lines. Nice, nice. Yeah, yeah the inf the infamous cupcake uh, scene in River Beast. <laughs> That's fantastic. It's fantastic. Uh, read a really good review. we got charlie in here too are you, you yes no yeah. yeah yeah i'm up to the charlie bit tell me how how you got that happening because obviously he's back in california now yeah he's in california and um he has a camera that uh shoots in hd and i just sent the lines over to him and then he emailed a file back to me it was very easy and uh it's amazing. Some of the, uh, most of this was shot on on the nice Canon X uh, D DSL, whatever it's called. Yeah, I, I um, forget as well. It's a combination of letters that yeah, ends in R and begins with D. But yeah. But some of it, uh, well, you were there for the basement scene. Some of it was just my wife Elizabeth's little tiny pink uh, Canon camera that also happens to shoot in uh, HD, and they cut together fine. I mean, uh, you can. I, the camera I have is real nice, and there's advantages to it, but you can make a, a feature-length movie on probably a, a $200, $300 camera. Yeah, there was a guy who released, a, I think it was a zombie movie in the UK, shot on his cell phone. So, yeah, yeah, it's amazing, and it looks uh, fine. But uh, this is the epic death scene of McGee here from Freaky Farley. Yeah. Just tremendous. There's that uh, outfit, of course, inspired partly by Shatner and Impulse, uh, another film <laughs> we've, we've covered yes. on the diner. Um, yeah, I mean, talk about that if you like. I don't know if you've talked about it on other commentaries, but talk briefly just about sort of some of the other films that that kind of inspire you. I mean, I know you've spoken about the B-movies that go into Freaky Farley and those, but into this one particularly, I know you said Stardust Memories, and I brought up Deconstructing Harry. It's kind of the clean, all wholesome Deconstructing Harry. But, uh, yeah, it's the wholesome suburban Deconstructing Harry Um that one I loved. I saw it in the theaters. It was the first Woody Allen movie I saw in the theaters, and um, I thought it was fantastic. And, I, and just like in that movie, how he weaves um, the the stories that that his character has written into the the script. I, I love that, and uh, it's constantly entertaining. For sure, Woody Allen is a major uh, influence on this movie, and um, probably just mixing Woody Allen with the um, filmmaking style of Kevin Smith. I think. Yeah, I mean, I got a Clerks vibe from it, not like an intentional Clerks vibe from, but but the pleasing part of like the Clerks vibe from it, definitely. Um, it was, if that makes any sense. Um, but uh, and it's not just the black and white. It was the, I think the anecdotal nature of it. Uh, I think one of the things that Smith hasn't really achieved doing since then is that nice 
anecdotal kind of uh, storytelling where the story is slowly building, but it's also lots of nice little sketches that have a hook and an end, you know. Which... Right, right. Little, like, it makes little side side travels on the way to its ultimate destination, maybe. Yes. Uh, yeah. It's said much better than I said it. Well done. <laughs> and um, also just the point and shoot of the camera. I mean, there's very little camera movement in the in the whole movie. It's pretty much just point at where the action is and leave it on the tripod. Yeah, I noticed that Charlie there stuck in a sneaky pan. Just I know. <laughs> I, I told him when I got the when I got it from him. I said, "I think that's the best camera work in the entire movie." Thank you. <laughs> no, but it's just like, oh, look at me. I'm Charlie. I'm the director. He's just trying to sneak in his little scene. Yeah, he's good. He's 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 no, much he better. Is. He's, he's great, much huh? better than me behind the camera for sure. But um. But uh, he can only fly out from California to New England so often, and uh, this right. isn't. This movie is just so completely self-absorbed. Matt Farley, um, <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> I would have felt he couldn't. He couldn't come. I mean, I offered to ha have him work on it with me, but it just wasn't happening. So, uh, but it would have been embarrassing just to also to in front of him to have to portray, portray myself as this character. I mean. It, it's so it's it's a little embarrassing when you make a movie completely about yourself it's uh, i'd like to apologize to the world for this, actually. <laughs> see not at all it's it's funny because there's a lot of stuff that that goes up online that is utterly egomaniacal and self-involved and self-important and really only put up there to you know say to people look at me look at me there is something again i hate to use this word because it, it, it should it shouldn't even have to apply but it, you know, there's something legitimate about this in comparison, um, and there's, there's something where you're, you're you are genuinely telling a story. You've genuinely put effort into the, the comedy of the script and the the you know character arcs and things like that. And you know, it's more than just a, a, the Matt Farley show. Look at me. And even if it was just the Matt Farley show, look at me, it would still be enjoyable. <laughs> so yeah, you know what I like, Bob Dylan, for instance. Um, he he and his people commissioned Martin Scorsese to make the most recent documentary about Bob Dylan from a few years back. Yeah, No Direction and, Home. And I mean, when you think about that, that's I mean. And then in the in, in one of the interviews, Bob talks about how he doesn't like people to pry into his life. To which I want to say, why, <laughs> why why are you cooperating with Martin Scorsese to make this movie if if you really don't want that? And and then there's movies like uh, Have you seen The Devil and Daniel Johnson? Yes, I have. Yeah. Yeah. Where again. Um, or Searching for Sugar Man. Have you seen that one yet? I, ha I haven't seen that one yet, but it's on my list. But all these movies that just could, they call themselves docu objective documentaries, but they're really just like uh, people tooting their horn, you know? Right, and, yeah, and completely. Unfortunately, nobody's, nobody wants to make a movie like that about me, probably because I'm, I'm not, my behavior isn't as extreme as, as people like Daniel Johnson. You know, I haven't crashed any planes, but... Right. I, personally, I like my songs better than his. But um, <laughs> if if I was crashing my dad's plane and, and behaving erratically, then suddenly people would tell, say I'm a genius. So I'm, I had to do make my own movie about how great I think I am. But but I don't. You know, I, I feel guilty about it at times. But at other times, I'm like, you know what? This is actually a more honest way of trying to get yourself out there than than a lot of these documentaries are. No, and I I would agree um, that. Again, though, it, it's, it, if it comes from a place of honesty, then it really doesn't feel, uh, you know, negatively self-aggrandizing or whatever. It just feels genuine. And I think that, um, you know, there is a part that, look, there's a part of every single artist, uh, if you're making music, if you're doing podcasts, if you're making movies, whatever it is, that is screaming, look at me, look at me, look at me. There's, you know, there's, there's part of all of us that's saying, you know, I, I want to be important. I want to be relevant. I want right. to listen to. And, and if you deny it, I, you, otherwise, why are you putting it out there? If you didn't right. want anyone to look at it, then you wouldn't put it out there. <laughs> right, exactly. So, I mean, there's nothing wrong, of course, with people who are humble or, you know, self-depreciating. That's absolutely fine. And we do that to keep our egos in check and to not be jerks or whatever it is. But, yes. you know, and that's, honest and legitimate too it's just um i think because you are putting it out there as uh an honest expression of what we all feel inside when we're putting stuff out there and doing things i think that's why it's okay that's why there's not an apology needed for it uh it, it's very odd in the things that uh, i pick in particular 
you know, some people can say, well, why do you like that but you don't like that when they seem to be on the same playing field? And I'm like, I don't know, but that just, whatever that positive thing was, it just seemed more legitimate. Yeah, or yeah, you can just more tell. Genuine. Yeah, you can just tell sometimes. Yeah, it just comes through. Yeah. Um, so uh, we talked over the film festivals bit, I apologize. You know, give us just a little bit of your history with, with film festivals, or is it all everything you put in the movie, you just submitted stuff and didn't get in? Um, uh, we've gotten into a couple of super small B-movie style festivals, but for the most part, um, I don't even, for this movie I haven't entered anywhere, and I don't think, I'm not sure if we entered River Beast anywhere. If we did, it was in no more than like three or four. But the whole scene is very much... Um, not something I, I really enjoy. I just, I get, I've been to a, a few. We were in, in, in 2003, one of our movies was in a, a festival and it just, it feels weird. And, and in general, it's it's the type, like the character, the Sharon character with the um, the costumes on the wall. It's those type of people who are very, just very uppity and, and they tend not to like a movie that's based on Silent Night, Deadly Night 2, you know? Right, right. Which is, <laughs> which is their own failing. That's their yeah, own I mean, problem. yeah, I disagree with it. They tend to like Blue Valentine and um, Take This Waltz. Yes, when you, when you mentioned that in the movie, uh, that was in the shower scene, right? Yes. Uh, just then, so it's relevant that we talk about it now. Uh, yeah, they are two of the worst <laughs> movies I could possibly imagine. I have the whole thing about if a movie stars Michelle Williams or Carrie Mulligan, it's going to be depressing. Don't and bother gonna, watching it. Yeah, and it's going to show them urinating too. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's going to show them urinating or showering unpleasantly or uh, them being miserable looking out of a window, whatever right. it is. Right, and, and, and for some reason, um, <laughs> writers go nuts over it, and they're like, oh, what a raw and honest portrayal <laughs> of, of a dissolving relationship. But uh, I don't, maybe it is, I don't know. I've, <laughs> I, I, I hate, the, like in Blue Valentine, I hate both of those characters. I, I don't want to spend any time with them. I'm not sure if people like that are like that or not. And if, even if they are, that doesn't mean I want to watch it. No, you know this. I want to watch a movie about a guy who likes to play basketball and, and record songs. <laughs> yeah, damn, damn right, damn right. I, I and I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, I I couldn't couldn't despise those films more. In fact, I just recently saw the next spate of trailers that came out, and almost every single you know worthy shot on grainy 16 mil or HD made to look like grainy 16 mil, starring someone who was on SNL but is now doing a thinky talky piece mm. with some like soft folk music in the background. Every uh, single one yeah. of them starts with the Sundance special selection. I'm like, how many of these movies was picked as special selection at Sundance? There's yeah. like five of them out at the moment. Yeah, it's 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 frustrating uh, that they get a lot of attention, but um, but well, all we can do is do make our stuff and, and yes. scream yes. scream in the wilderness, and maybe someone will notice us by the time we're like seventy. Yes, def <laughs> definitely. Well, look, you're already as far as I'm concerned, you're already being noticed, and I think that when we were talking about. Um, the title local legends i think when i said said to you originally that it, it's got that aspect of it that online you can be a local legend as well because you're not just a local legend in manchester you you know you have an online presence now and whether you know you whether you tend to it avidly as i do or not you know you, you are out there and and that can only grow surely i mean this has already got almost a thousand it's what 650 700 watches already on YouTube. yeah it's in that ballpark yeah and I, I only represent maybe what four or five hundred of those. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know. No, I'm, I'm, I've, I've made a point of not uh, messing the counter by looking at it myself. So I'm, yeah. I'm very pleased that anyone's looked at it. It's great. No, it's, 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 it's fantastic, and that's you know, it's only been up a couple of weeks, so that's, uh, that's just great. Uh, we found this scene uh, uh, utterly charming as well. Um, obviously, this is, this is not how you really met Elizabeth, is it? Correct. But um, I was walking late at night because um, th that's what I do. I actually walk, you know, 15 to 20 miles sometimes uh, listening to the Red Sox. And I, I had my hands up because it's true that you get kind of the blood will, will, will stick in your fingers. And I was thinking to myself, ooh, this would be a good meat cute, as they say. Yes. Uh, and and um, just from a filmmaking point of view, this is fun because... I'm, I had to drive to New York to film with Tom, bring him to New York, and 
and was I going to bring Elizabeth on a five hour ride each way to film this scene between the three of us and, and, uh, and then feel guilty about the fact that I've forced her to go through this and, and she's sitting in Tom's house where we're doing the rest of the scene. So I decided I'm going to give her the day off, let her stay home. So when it's me and Tom, we're in New York. When it's me and Elizabeth, we're in Massachusetts. But uh, it cut together quite well. It cut together really well. Yeah, you can't tell at all. The angles are great and the uh, coverage is fine. It's uh, Yeah, there's yeah. actually three different locations at the end when the car drives away. That's that's the third location that we uh, that we went to for that one, too. And it's Elizabeth driving the car with no one else in it. But uh, that was good because a lot of a lot of the indie filmmaking is just figuring out ways that you can do it and get people in it without annoying them so much that they won't be in your next movie <laughs> right indeed indeed um but uh yeah no you film quick you only do a couple of takes and uh you get all that you need nicely easily and quickly you keep the uh mood up and people stay positive so uh yeah i can't imagine anyone turning you down to be in the film uh yeah yeah but even there's the the, the difference between to a year in advance when someone says yes i'll be in your movie to the day before when you tell them you need them for eight hours and they say well actually i can only give you four and yeah. you say, oh god but um there's plenty of tricks that we've learned over the years to to make it happen and i mean you know in a perfect world there'd be a lot more two shots with people talking to each other but it was it just came down to it we're just gonna have to do tight shots of everybody's head just talking occasionally you know if we're po able to get one or two lines in the same shot that would be fantastic but it's mostly just i read the line from behind the camera and then the person repeats it and then we move on yeah but it establishes its own style i think i i like i like the style i like i like close-ups anyway so i'm i'm pro close-up and i think it looks great in black and white too i'm very pleased with the black and white yeah, definitely. Um, I think uh, it was Tarantino when, when video cameras first came out said, you know what, forget trying to shoot on film, just shoot on video in black and white. Now, obviously, this is better than, than video, but it has the same kind of uh, exciting quality to it. And it's different. You don't really sort of see a lot of black and white films. So. Yeah, I, I love black and white anyway. Yeah, Woody hasn't even done one since Celebrity. No, um, which again gets a bad rap, but I, I, I like that one. That was all right. So yeah. this scene, so this uh, interview, this this actually happened. No, I'm, okay. I made I made this one up, but oh, okay. I mean similar. There have been lots of similar situations, um, just like the Billy Joel scene where sure. I, um, you know, I I would describe what happened later to a friend, and they say you you're an idiot don't you understand <laughs> right <laughs> that she liked you and i was like oh man but like i say in the movie i i'm i would have been more excited that she was interested in the in my movie than if she were interested in me and i i think i bet you there's plenty of um of creative people like us who would feel the same way yeah no i agree and it's a good point to it's a good point to be made uh and i think that's always the danger isn't it that you do something creative and you put it out there and then if you get attention from the opposite sex or the same sex or whatever it is, you hope that it's attention for the what you're doing and not not for some other reason. <laughs> yeah, so they'll they'll like that you do stuff more than what you do sometimes. Right, you know exactly. I mean? yeah, 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 completely. I agree. Yeah, but I mean, definitely situations like that. And uh, I, I thought it was very funny for a girl to make an obvious um, suggestion like that and for me to just respond with, here's the commentary track, you know? Yeah, right, exactly. And I think also it, it what it does is it shows that if you recognize the vibing or whatever that you're getting off Elizabeth's character, it, it, it's added to by the fact that you haven't got the vibes from everybody else. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I was, I'm slow to develop, but, you know, past age 30, I'm, I'm finally figuring out <laughs> a couple of things about girls. Yes, you finally got the, the vibe radar going. <laughs> Which is great. Uh, if you find anything more out, please tell me because uh, I've got no idea. Um, yeah, but... this is my uh, my brother-in-law did the voice of the old guy for the diaper changing scene. And uh, what we had to time it, you know, I, I went over his house and recorded all his lines. And then um, I, had, I had Elizabeth behind the camera and she would read what he said quickly. And I, I'd, 
in post, I lowered the volume to take her out and drop my brother-in-law as the old guy in, and it, it lined up pretty well. I liked how you had stuck seemingly official hospital stuff up on the wall, <laughs> but only stuck along the top. Didn't bother to do all four sides. Uh, it's, it's such a haphazard attempt. <laughs> at, but I mean, I even admit through the narration that this clearly isn't a real thing. So I think right. pe I figured people would get a kick out of it. But uh, it's fun. And if you read what they are, they, they're all these just, they have nothing to do with, with old age homes either. <laughs> no, of course. <laughs> But no, there's something, because obviously there's a lot of like breaking the fourth wall in the narration and things like that. But there's also, um, you know, and the idea that you're doing adverts within the movie and things. It's 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 like it, the, where, it, where it's similar to your other three films as a viewer, as purely as a viewer rather than being involved in it, is that um, it comes across as one of those ideas where you go, oh, yeah, of course. And it seems like effortless, but I'm, you know, but, if you want to just but it isn't, right it clearly this. isn't. But you yeah, have a way of, of honing in on, I mean, it's a, it's a style, it's a voice. It's something that, you know, sadly few, too few filmmakers actually have. And whether you're talking about yourself or whether you're talking about a, a river beast or whatever it is, you seem to have the ability. And I think that as a, you know, as a film watcher, as someone who, who loves this kind of stuff, I... That's what I'm constantly trying to get at. I think that's why I keep bringing it up is because I'm constantly trying to, what is that little thing? What is that light? Uh, where's that coming from? You know what I mean? And Yeah, uh, yeah. I think I think it's, it, you know, pa is it passion? You know, is it is it like the people making this movie were ha having a good time in, in the right way, do you, maybe? You know? Yeah, 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 definitely. Be because there's plenty of movies where people were clearly having a good time and the movie they made was horrendous. So that's not always the uh, the dividing line, but... If if you if you know if you know what you're going for, you know maybe that's it too. And things like okay, so things like this hiring a statistician or whatever to help that's with a true your story. basketball games. That's a true story. Yes. Yeah. Okay. A, a girl. She's a filmmaker, Lisa Romanoli. She's in New York City, and um, she used to live in Manchester. And, and a comedian friend, Sean Tumblety, and I, we were playing basketball, and we just said you, we should hire a statistician and. And we gave her ten dollars per hour, and it was hilarious. We had a blast. <laughs> nice. She but, was a much better statistician than this character is in the movie. Right, uh, but something like that—it's you know—it's from left field. It doesn't. It's not every day. Um, but it, yeah, but it adds to the overall style. Right, and in keeping with our other movies, it's the. Wouldn't it be great if life was really like this? You know, in in River Beast, there's a moment where the girl dances to Tom's guitar playing and then she says I need a shower can I come over to your place and he says sure and, and, and clearly this doesn't happen in real life but wouldn't it be great if it did <laughs> yeah of course uh, yeah. that's that's, an, that's like another nice aspect of it um, but also it's you know it's you also are able to avoid that I hate to say like nerdy or geek thing because mm. there's something nerdy and geeky to it so in the traditional kind of sense, in the yeah, terms of like, oh, math is cool or whatever. Right. But but it's not, no oh, look how nerdy cute we're being or whatever like the new thing is. Right, <laughs> yeah, I know I know exactly what you're saying. And I'm definitely, uh, I'm, I'm not against the nerd movement necessarily, but it's it's a bit much also. <laughs> well, no, it comes back, I think, to that that thing of legitimacy. Uh, and and the line that people walk is, it's great to be nerdy, it's great to be geeky, it's awesome to love this stuff. But if it feels it forced or if it feels right. put on, you yeah. immediately, I do anyway, I immediately withdraw from that. If yeah. I if I hear someone go, oh yeah, well of course I know Bruce Campbell, I just want to kill them, you know, because I'm like, <clears throat> you know, they probably don't, they probably watch Burn Notice, you know, <laughs> that's yeah. about it, or they've probably seen Army of Darkness once or something like. That. And there's, I don't know why we're so territorial about it, but there is a certain legitimacy that you crave from your friends or from fellow fans of stuff i think right like yeah yeah like like i'm a i'm actually a billy joel fan but if i had like i'm sure i could have chosen a different um you know cultural reference point um that would have been cooler maybe or or if someone wasn't a billy joel fan and they chose billy joel um 
in order to be purposely subversive. Do you know what I mean? Oh yeah, completely. Yeah. And I love, I mean, <clears throat> I love the fact you picked Billy Joel, but I love the fact you picked Billy Joel because I love Billy Joel. Yeah, and, and, and that's it. That's the actual, that's what it was way back in, in 1998 when it right. happened. <laughs> Which is great that even in 1998, Joel had that kind of pull over people. I know, it's fantastic. And there's a certain... Um, I know exactly what you mean because that's that is that is the fine line. You could have picked Billy Joel because hey, you know Billy Joel's kind of unpopular for whatever reason. Nobody knows why he's unpopular, but he is. Yeah. Uh, despite the continual popularity of of some other people who, you know, beggars belief why they're popular. Yeah. <laughs> um, can, can we? Uh, I, we passed it, but the record store scene that was filmed in Providence, Rhode Island. A friend of mine from college owns it. It's called Analog Underground. Very cool place on Broadway in Providence, and uh, and that was fun. We had a lot of laughs filming that scene. Yeah, you cut cut me off anytime, dude. Anytime something needs to be mentioned. Yeah, uh, and one other thing on display next to the Mos Haven CDs is a Jandek record, and I'm he's my new obsession musically. He's this guy from Houston who's been putting out. A, sort of anonymously putting out albums since 1978 and he's like the avant-garde version of me it's pretty cool oh and you told me a story was he the guy you told me a story about that you sent an album to or a video to or something yeah i sent him a copy of this also so i'm curious to see what he says <laughs> but he's he's a recluse he's the, you know he doesn't do interviews or yeah yeah you know and and part of the mystery about him seems a little bit contrived by by fans of his almost you know he's not as reclusive as he's reported to be sort of and and he's he's done a few concerts uh in the last decade but he's very interesting stuff is he on a label or is it just no, independent just him, just him putting out his own cds and he used to do lps it's it's very very fascinating cool so but I, I to, yeah i wanted to give him a little credit uh, dave the owner of the record store had some jandex so we said "Ooh, let's put him right next to the uh the ucd rack that'll be good no that's great yeah pimp yeah. pimp away and uh, pro uh yeah give props where where needed yeah yeah and elizabeth did a fine job in this phone call scene i was pleased with that one Oh yeah, no, she's great in the movie. Um, yeah, she's completely great in the movie. Everyone is. I mean, the performances are, are fantastic. In fact, I, I saw that our, our mutual acquaintance uh, and Robert Long had contacted you recently. Yes, um, he took me up on the. Uh, you know, in the movie, I give out my real phone number. That's actually my phone number, and uh, he, he took me up, and we had a phone call. He's a good guy. Yeah, him of smash or trash independent filmmaking. Yes, and great. he he loves. I mean, he's obviously seen and reviewed your other films, and I believe he's giving away the copy of River Beast that I gave away in a competition that he won. Nice. Um, but <laughs> so the cycle continues. But um, he gave this rave reviews. He thought he thought this was your best yet. Cool. Yeah, and in you know, giving away anyone out there trying to get their stuff out there, giving away your stuff. I think one paying t the money it costs to have real packaging uh, makes a difference. You know, I have we use disc makers to make like a thousand DVDs at a time, and and people are more apt to look at your stuff or listen to your stuff if it's if it's really packaged as opposed to if you just give them a DVD-R. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, but, uh, definitely. But leaving stuff on on sidewalks, mailing stuff. I just mail free stuff to record stores, and you never know where your stuff's going to end up. And it's it's pretty cool. And you recently appeared on an episode of the Bone Zone. Is that what it's called? Yep, they found my music during one of their shows, and they saw my phone number listed, and they called me. I talked with them on the air and told them what I was up to, and they they thought it was interesting. And a couple of days later, they did a full episode interview with me, and and that's definitely been a good way to ex uh, expose my stuff to a bunch of other people. Yeah, I, it, it's odd. I, I find that you have to keep throwing darts and one day one will hit you know and whatever it is it, it, it'll be a weird thing that you'll put up and you'll think ah it's not necessarily right. my best thing or that's a weird website to contact but you know uh, whatever yeah, it is it, it, and it's so true and sometimes you know i i get i met some guys in texas in 2003 and gave them some cds and a decade later one of them wrote a song about meeting me and used clips from freaky farley in the video and it was just like really cool to think that he remembered and uh was inspired to do that and i think before we we even spoke or before i'd even seen maybe um manch vegas i think i'd only seen freaky farley i found that video on youtube that oh that, funny yeah that band song i think it was a fun song i was that, that made my day i watched it like 20 times yeah that's right. <laughs> 
um and w- within the plot with the the mo- the show comedy show is supposed to be at a big auditorium and it's working its way down to a basement that is very true to life um whether it be in your filmmaking or in in the comedy world or anything there's it's just it's you have to laugh at at how your ambitions are slowly cr- crushed beneath um practical matters and uh yeah. i enjoyed i enjoyed recreating that in the movie See, my, my experience, I've only done two live things. My experience was that um, it, it was at a great venue, but nobody showed up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, I've, I've performed in, in empty places or, or just at venues that somebody wanted to put on a comedy show at some uh, hunting club, for instance, and, and they got a bunch of comedians to show up, but it was a very bad idea. Everyone else at the hunting club wanted to hang out and talk about hunting and watch like uh, the football game on the TV, and we're up there performing, and nobody's <laughs> paying any attention to us. And uh, But some of the comedians get uptight and, and upset about it, but I just embrace it. I'm like, this is this is spectacular. What an experience this is. Yeah, of course. No, you've got to have, you've got to have a sense of humor about this stuff. Um, uh, nothing better in the world than a thick skin, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you've got to uh, you've got to laugh a lot of this stuff so, off. So that we we miss McGee's great, great line. But he goes, "Soup cures nothing." That's my favorite line. <laughs> the movie could have almost yeah, been called and then, Soup uh, cures nothing. You know, it's it's definitely subtle where I talk about um, the origin. The origin. I think I'll try it. Kind of like a cave here. Sorry, man, yeah, you you ducked out a minute there. The, sorry, the, when you talk about the origin of of the phrase "under the weather," can you hear me now? I, I can hear you now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. But McGee was um, McGee is like you know I will bounce a lot of things off McGee. He's like a, a spiritual advisor for me. So those scenes were kind of recreating our uh, friendship for sure. Yeah, definitely, definitely. He's he, yeah, phenomenal. <laughs> Just a, I just a joy, but no, these scenes, these scenes are nice as well. There's, uh, there's a lot of chemistry. I mean, I don't know whether you want to go into the fact that like you guys are married and now and all that, but uh, oh yeah, yeah, no, um, we're happily married and we forgot to take our wedding rings off for the whole movie, which is great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, what can you do? Um, this is tremendous. The the way Millhouse plays this scene with the money. Oh, he did great. He he was really good at this. I was very very pleased with his performance right here. Uh, but he, I mean, he's he, I think his best skill is as as the the MC of an event. You know, he can keep a show moving, and so I kind of put his best um, skills on display for this movie. Oh God, who's that? Uh, get him off the screen. <laughs> and that's not no, false modesty. That's just I can't bear looking at it. Anyway, carry on. <laughs> Yeah, tell me about your experience um, shooting this this basement scene. Well, it was weird because obviously we'd never met. Uh, we talked, we'd interviewed on the the diner, and we corresponded via Twitter. And you know, I'm since being on Twitter, I've been very kind of jump in with both feet forward. You know, the next person you talk to could be the the friend you haven't met yet, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But uh, so it was kind of weird, and it was kind of nervous. But I. I whatever ability I have is to just click a switch and just talk my way through it. And, um, yeah, once I got down to the basement and I saw what was going on and you had the camera set up and I had the line, it was, yeah, it was fine. It was, um, yeah, it was great. I almost wanted to do more, you know. <laughs> Cause yeah, I think uh, we after we filmed all the show, we we went back into the um, the laundry area and reshot your line, and we ended up using that um, that version. It was a tighter shot on you, and um, we had a little more time to do it. And I think I think that's the time that we inserted the part about Millhouse um, not giving me change yet, because that had that that was never in the script, and we just we you know work that into the script after i filmed that scene with millhouse i think yeah and are we ever going to get a, a sort of director's cut of the just of the comedy show with the full <laughs> sets and everything like that no i don't think i'm i'm so happy to be done with editing i just <laughs> I, I put the hard drive in the basement and said this is it i'm not making any bonus features i'm done this is the movie i can't bear to be in front of the computer anymore right i understand that i understand that yeah. so let's talk about some of these people who are in the crowd obviously we've got matt d he'll be coming up 
he's a local he's very much a, a, a national legend now right yeah i think he's gonna go places he's still still young and he's he's doing it the way you're supposed to be doing it in the comedy world performing six nights a week and just um honing his skills he's got lots of gigs all over the place and uh, i have high hopes for him it's good to catch people like that when they're uh, on their way up and then you can take advantage of it when when he's big time i'll be like look matt d's in my movie yeah exactly that's that's the dream right yeah absolutely he becomes the next seinfeld or whatever and the um and then the you've got another couple in the back your friends i'm sorry i forget their names uh al and laura al, and laura, uh, al went to college with elizabeth and um and They've been friends ever since, and uh, and Laura's his uh, his wife, and they were uh, they were awesome. Not Al Al also operated the um, the little camera, which came in incredibly handy. I mean, this is it's kind of insane to be filming a, an entire basement show and not knowing until the you start who's going to be operating the cameras, you know? Right. <laughs> but <laughs> that's just the oppor- that's just the way it worked out. So we had Casper Cadillac, which he's a friend of Millhouse and he's sitting next to Dory there. Um, he operated the camera quite a bit and that was super helpful and Al <laughs> did the other one and we had one on a tripod. The one Al was holding was Lisbeth's. The only downside of that is that it had autofocus and I, I don't think there was anything you could do about it. So it goes in and out of focus at times, but I I just convinced myself that we were going for like a document documentary style right there. Yeah, if if, if in doubt say cinema verite and move on. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And 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 the the whole the whole idea of the whole movie I always just told myself was get the point across. You don't have to be cute or good about it. So I also liked using texts up on the screen. It's like uh, I could I could find five different ways to show what's happening in the plot or I could just drop the words onto the screen and move on and, and that worked for me. Yeah, and you do that throughout the movie, and there's some nice things with the texting and stuff like that that's really effective, I think, with the, the title cards. And, of course, we just missed Ido Hukins himself is sat there in the comfortable chair, of course. Oh, yes, my father. Yeah, I gave him the best chair and uh, just told him to sit back and enjoy himself, and he had a blast. And my mom playing Milhouse's mom was, I think it's hysterical the way she comes down the stairs. <laughs> it's fantastic. And she, uh, you know, I didn't even direct her to it, but she on her own decided to really stomp down those stairs and as if she really <laughs> thought nothing of the performance going on on the other side. And I think it, it was, I, that that is exactly uh, what it's about to be a local legend. Here you are putting your heart and soul into this performance and some woman is just completely unfazed and un- unimpressed by what you're doing. Yeah. And and Milhouse's friend, Mr. Cadillac, he was he's an interesting character. He's in a lot of the, the cooking with comedy sketches. Yes, absolutely. Those guys are, are, are awesome and they um, they churn it out just like I do, you know, and, and that's it's admirable. For there sure. he is in the background mugging with his head shaking. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was good. I mean, uh, it was again when you're filming down there you just want to you want to get all the shots as quickly as possible because people are nice but um you don't want them to get super bored so you know at the end of shooting then it was i i got these close-ups of everybody i'm like all right laugh all right um don't laugh act this way act that way and, and it was super helpful to have cutaways but it was nice because we were sat down there being entertained you know what i mean there was always something going on millhouse was telling a joke or doing a song or you were doing a joke or a song and you know, Matt D was hilarious, and it was great. It was it yeah, was it easy was, to do it. It was a unique, very unique experience, and and it was all with the right kind of people who were you know up for for interesting stuff. So it was it was a good crowd, and um, so I, I mean I think this scene works one as showing the pathetic. Um, the, a pathetic basement show that people like us do and we really do but also at just showing that even though we're small time we're we have some you know talents where we actually can put on a good show just our life circumstances are such that this is our only opportunity it was created by Al Gore but you know I often find with those kind of gigs 10 years from now people will be like where were you the night we did that you know great basement yes. show Yes, yes. I think, like, uh, I've always said, like, on the road with Jack Kerouac, um, those guys are just a bunch of guys acting crazy and driving around. And the fact that Kerouac wrote a, a, you know, a poetic book about it turns it into this, you know, amazing moment that you wish you were a part of. But at the time, it was it was not that that good. And so I've, I've just said, all right, look, I, 
I'm going to do the same thing for things in my life. I'm going to, I want to glorify him. And that's what, yeah, this is me glorifying my life. So this is Matt Farley's on the road then. <laughs> I like for him, sure. man. I like yeah, him, man. It's, yeah, it's... and I, I love Milhouse singing Life is Like a Pancake. That is, um, that's a, one of his actual songs. He's got several songs on iTunes. Look up, look up Milhouse G and he's got uh, tons of songs that I've worked, I've worked on a lot of them with him too. Uh, now this is my uh, auspicious camera work <laughs> in terms of the fact oh, that I, yeah. I, I pressed, that. I pressed yeah. the button and then stepped away. No, you're also um, helpful with eye lines because I, I have no idea what I'm doing and you're like, no, you're looking the complete wrong way. And I said, oh, good, thank you. Because <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. I'm... The, the funny thing is, is that if you, you know, with film school or film so courses or anything like that, it's, it's like the, the only thing I remember yeah, from that. And I couldn't even describe it if I had to, if someone sat me down and go, oh, explain the line, I couldn't do it, but I could do it. But you know what is, you know what's right and you know what's wrong. Yeah, yeah well, just about. What I was doing was what you're on. Yeah, and the clock behind Elizabeth, I don't know what time it said, but it didn't, I don't think it was, it fit um, for the time of day it should have been, but oh well. Oh, of course. <laughs> um, and uh, so yeah, and then <clears throat> we're sort of coming up towards the wrap up of the film, aren't we? So this, all these story strands are gonna be yeah and it together. was clearly just basically i said to myself all right we have just got to wrap this thing up let's quickly throw soup and uh abby together boom done and then let's quickly wrap up the uh the story of me and uh genevieve and let's get out of here while while the things are still still good because like annie hall for instance i think the last 20 minutes are kind of drag as far as i'm concerned so um if 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 woody allen drags a bit for me then i'd have no right being longer than an hour and 14 <laughs> minutes yeah no i mean i could have watched this for another hour but that's a, you could make a tv series about this it wouldn't be a problem the yeah. um but what i like is that even when soup and Ab, like soup even though you've told it told him this horror stories he's still like okay i'm gonna go after abby and then when he goes after abby the same thing happens to him and he's immediately annoyed by it <laughs> rather than you know, and that's men. That's men in general. I yes, think. yes, I know. He hears all this negative, and the girl invites herself over. He's like, "How? Yeah, you know, how can you say no?" <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> we don't know when the next girl's going to invite herself over. So. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's it's it's interesting. Yeah. Um, and then uh, Millhouse is good. Millhouse the little, last little scene, and then I, I I tried to do a lot of springboards from the end of one scene to the beginning of the next. So the scene with Millhouse ends with him mentioning the prom songs which then springboards me into doing one last ad advertisement for uh, for all the name songs. And I had yeah. fun doing that. I, I like to believe that Phil Collins watches this film and is kicking himself. He didn't think of it. I think that's what happens. <laughs> it's just because the, the only similarity is like the idea that, that a lot of your albums obviously have, have your uh, image on them, your face on them. And all yeah. of his albums have his face on them. Now, <laughs> now I understand why you do it. I think he just does it because he thinks I'm Phil Collins. But uh, <laughs> see, this, that's another thing. Is like Billy Joel, I think, should be really popular. Phil Collins, on the other hand, I don't really understand. But that's just uh, that's just yeah. One of those yeah I mean, they they both they're in the same. Uh, they're both they both wrote catchy stuff in the '80s, you know. And, yeah. Uh, but it's, one, it's, but one I will abide, and the other one I won't. <laughs> <laughs> I like them both. Oh no! Uh, I mean, yeah, there's plenty to to. Uh, I mean, I used to listen to them growing up. That's where I got it all from. My mum used to listen to all of that stuff. But. How did you like the callback to the book, uh, "How to Improve Your uh, Filmmaking Technique"? Did you like I, that? I loved it. I loved that each character had an arc. I know you reference it in the in the scene, but I love how all the characters have an arc. I love how everything gets wrapped up. I love the the book device. Um, it just, it just everything in the film that, that really on paper shouldn't necessarily work because of a lot of the things we've discussed, like there's adverts in it and it's about you and, you know, all the other stuff that, that could have failed and it doesn't, it succeeds on, on all points. The, the scenes of me and the businessman version of me, that was a long day of just me by myself in the dining room setting up the camera and, and trying to get the focus done properly which is hard when you're you, when you got to be on both sides of the camera at the same time you know sure. well, and you, then, need, you, you clearly need to do more of that because those <laughs> scenes are gold you need it to works. yeah i think when you do the paparazzi movie you need to play paparazzi but you need to play everyone else in the movie too <laughs> yeah well, i mean it's it's a little like not only am i um 
filming all by myself. I'm going out on a limb with this character that I've never tried before, you know, with my hair slicked back and the and the and the coat on and like this could be really embarrassing and really bad. So uh it se it worked out. It seems to have worked out uh Thank goodness, but uh, it was several times during that day I was saying, what am I doing? And it was hot, I was sweating a lot, it was just a long day. So it's the experience I have editing a podcast then. Yeah, oh yeah. That's yeah. kind of the experience I always have, especially writing those opening sketches. I'm always like, who listens to this stuff? Why would I bother doing this? <laughs> yeah. Why no, am that, I doing these different voices? Um, I don't want to talk about me, I'm just equating no, no, it with keep, the... Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, I liked uh, bringing the John Noble creepy guy back in this little scene. <laughs> that's amazing. That that got such a laugh for me when, when, I, when I saw it. I thought that was tremendous. Yeah, um, and again, I'm in Massachusetts. The real me is in Massachusetts. The businessman me is just in the driveway. This guy's driveway in, in New Hampshire, so he shot it super tight and cut it before the car even got all the way out of the way, and it, it, it worked. But it's also yet another step because it's it's yet, I, I can't even go into all the layers because the business guy is meant to be in your head, but then suddenly <laughs> he's in reality, and he's yeah. with a guy you've been referencing the whole movie who we're meant to believe is real. Oh, yeah, he's real too. I don't, yeah, I have no... It's, but something like that happens in um, Stardust Memories where there, someone gets taken away by the aliens near the end, just totally out of left field, or like, or big... Oh, I think like... Um, the Bigfoot character from his other movie attacks a, a character in reality. Do you know what I, I don't know if you remember, but. Oh yeah, no, I know, yeah. It was that same idea at the end where it just nothing matters anymore. Let's just wrap this up in as entertaining a way as possible because everyone knows it's a movie and, and who cares, you can do anything. Oh yeah, no, completely. It's, it's, it's fantastic. I love that kind of stuff. And I, I, I almost like my head getting into knots trying to decipher the joke. Um, it's always fantastic. Yeah, and then we wrap up with uh, with coffee milk. It's perfect, and it's it's nice that you're. It's it's nice that instead of like you don't put your arm around her, there isn't some big thing. It it says so much more about the chemistry that you're just comfortable and you just sit down, cross your legs, cross your arms, and away you go. It it works really well. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. We um we did it a couple a couple different times, and that was the one that worked best. Uh, the best part about it was with each take, I would drink so much coffee milk that we had to make a new cup of it for me uh, shucks oh, what a shame <laughs> damn it that's like oh i'm gonna do a film in a diner i've got to drink all this milkshake and then uh, i'm gonna have more milkshake um uh, yeah. but uh, no fantastic film thank you for letting me be part of the the commentary i hope people have found this informative or enjoyable or whatever um that's that's great uh, so just lastly dude what's what's next for for matt farley and Moton media um, I'm just delving back into the music. I've, I've put music on hold quite a bit for this movie, so I'm uh, I'm churning out the hits, celebrity songs, and and you name it, uh, name songs, and, and and on and on and on. Um, I'm happy to not film anything for a while. Um, I do. I've I have dreams of a full-length paparazzi movie that uh, could test the patience of, of just about anybody. <laughs> and Charlie and I actually are meeting up in just a few days. He's going to be in New England, and we're going to plan Slingshot Cops, which we're going to film in 2015, and I would expect a 2016 release. And it's it's going to be kind of like our lethal weapon meets Fiend. Which is, which is just tremendous. <laughs> that, that, that speaks to me on every single level. That I, That's got action which you know i love it's mm -hmm. got like weird b-movie horror which you know i love and and it's got you guys it's just that it's going to be like the ultimate charlie farley movie it's going to be great. yeah i can't wait tom is actually going to meet us too at we're going to the town where friday the 13th part two was filmed great just to make a pilgrimage and uh the whole time we'll be taking notes and, and brainstorming it's gonna be a good time Excellent. Well, it's endlessly fascinating to talk to you, sir, and uh, we'll do it again. Look forward to seeing you in New York City for the uh, big city premiere of uh, of Local Legends. I never get tired of watching it. This will be my, when you come in September, it'll be my fifth time of seeing it, I think. Excellent. Uh, I watched it twice the day it was released. Nice. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, and then I had to show Dory when she came home. So um, I think I watched it maybe three times the first day it came out. Uh, it was yeah it's a joy it's a thrill thanks ever so much man uh, alright good times I'll sort this out I'll put it up and I'll see you soon alright bye bye
Ta-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-